Hi there, welcome to the Love Fly, Fear of Flying Q&A. Paul Tizard here, um, one of the main hosts on the podcast, which hopefully you've listened to, and one of the people that works behind the scenes, doing as much as we can, as well as much as we can get in. There's so many people, other people doing stuff at Love Fly. So welcome to the, the weekly, mostly weekly, so apologies straight away. Uh, Gita said in the uh, Facebook group, the Love Fly Facebook group, that there will be some sort of exotic place that I might be talking from today. And unfortunately, I'm not. I'm not out and about today. I'm just uh, at home. But if it helps, I'm quite near Gatwick Airport, UK. So, you know, I don't know if that's exotic enough for you, but that's, that's the best I can do. So this week... A uh, few few questions have come in, so thank you very much for those, and we'll go through them. And it's been a really interesting week for me because we've got a few meetings that we've been sorting out. So, for example, John Bond is coming over from Toronto. He's going to join Susan and I, Susan Mundrum and I, and we're going to meet up and spend a good two or three days together. We've got some, some big meetings where we'll, you know, we'll probably do his head in, and then. Uh, we will go and visit some facilities ooh, uh, where we're hoping to run some face-to-face -face training. That's right. Uh, but uh, try not to do too much of a spoiler alert because it's until it's agreed, it's not agreed. It doesn't exist. That's why I think I'm very sort of practical like that. But I'm very, very hopeful it's actually going to come off. Um, yep. So that's some of the things. Uh, so we will tell you more about that when we know. Uh, I'd like to say as well, hello or hola to uh, Pedro. Pedro Higgins, who's in Spain, probably watching this because he's so dedicated. Even though he's on holiday with Janet, it's Janet's birthday. Happy birthday, Janet. He has still been in the Facebook group writing away. So such is the dedication of the man. And so those who haven't come Pete Higgins, I don't know what's wrong with you. You need to check out his flight checklist, which he has generously given to Love Fly uh, to help people. Thousands of people have downloaded it, and you've just got to get your head around that because then once you see the sequence that everyone goes through on every flight and every airport, every aircraft type, it's just then helps the logical part of your brain sort of pointing all over there. Then I wasn't sure where mine was. I think it's probably near the front there. It just helps that part of the brain to then go, okay, this is, this is you know, familiarity breeds content, as it says in the audio book. So if you want the flight checklist, you can get it from the Lovefly group in the files page, Lovefly Facebook group. You can also get it, where else can you find it? You can email us, we'll send you a copy of it. Uh, it might be in a couple of other places. It might be on the lovefly.co.uk um, website. Can't remember now. Anyway, but it's available and Pete has given that as a gift. So thank you, Peter. And I hope your holiday's going well. Uh, we've actually got nice weather today. So um, that's what I can say to you, mate. All right. Let's get into some questions then. That's some great, I've done some great podcast interviews this week. So that's not questions, but I just wanted to say I'm really grateful for this. So I'm still waiting for the Medair one, which is like the company that provides aviation medicine help for um, passengers when you're flying like longer routes, like across the big bits of water. Uh, they are a company based in Phoenix, Arizona, and they is a hospital. And basically, when you're unwell, uh, you get connected to all these machines and your information gets zapped down there. It's probably a little bit more technical than I'm describing it. And then they can take your readings. And the, yeah, so they came on and did podcasts, but it's just, it's just, it's been edited, but just waiting for them to do the final sign off. And then we'll share that one hopefully soon. Uh, for those who enjoyed Mez is um, podcast last week is also on YouTube. I didn't go out straight away because we've actually got a video of it as well. So if you want to watch the podcast, I like some people like to do that. Uh, we're trying to build up our Love Fly Facebook group, by the way. So if you could subscribe, that would be amazing. The last one that we had was the the Virgin Fly Without Fear one, and we got up to 
nearly 2,000 subscribers on that. But on the Love Fly Facebook group, which is our newer one, it's we're up just coming under 200 at the moment. So it'd be great to get it over the thousand mark. So, and if we see more people subscribe, we'll start stuffing more content on them, which is something we're working on at the moment as it happens. This week, I have spoken to Chris Grubb, who was fantastic did a great interview together, which was really, really good. He's shared loads of his tips. And so for those who've seen some of his posts, he had a phenomenal story. So his podcast may well come out this week, but I think that's looking like my favorite for this week. Uh, we also spoke to, uh, it was, this, will be a, this will be a fantastic one. This one comes out and it was on video as well. But I had, um, I don't know, maybe eight or nine people who volunteer doing, you know, the therapy animals, you come across that. Uh, so John Bond linked that all up and uh, found them. Oh, amazing. So they've, they're, um, yeah, so that was, <laughs> I've never done the interview before. So these people are so passionate about helping people to relieve anxiety at the airports. And and they came and did their, the interview with us. And um, But <laughs> on the call, there's like Labradors, Gold Retrievers, there's a cat. Um, so they're talking about their therapy and stuff that are mainly over in the US, but I've seen a few places in uh, Europe and there may be some in the UK that thought that as well. So uh, I just thought that was such a cool, I felt the whole time just grinning, you know, because I'm talking to this person. And there's a Labrador sat next to her, right? you know. <laughs> That's my Labrador impression, and it just really made me laugh that uh, you know this is this is what we're doing. So it's a it was a great one, John, to find that one. But uh, yeah, so that'll probably be out. I reckon next week. Don't know. Yeah. So that's things coming up. Got a few more interviews as well uh, coming up, and I need to apologise to uh, Danny. Uh, Whereas you want Danny Spooner because uh, we were meant to be talking, and then I completely really stuffed it up. We got the wrong times, and uh, oh, you know we kept crossing so hopefully that one will still come through and there's got a couple of others that are lined up Ooh. questions so aphrodite asked there's been more incidents involving military aircraft lately um what's the differences versus civilian and this is interesting isn't it because i haven't noticed any of those but this is what happens when you have a fear of something your brain is sort of like zooms in on the stuff do you know what i mean and that's so you're picking up stuff that i'm not even noticing you know and uh maybe other people can relate to this it's like the, they call it red mini syndrome you know it's like you know the mini car so you buy yourself a red car or whatever and you or you buy a, anything and you then suddenly see everybody else has got the same one you go my goodness everyone's got them. there's hundreds of them is that just because your brain sees what you pay attention to is uh, called filter theory so as soon as you pay attention to something or you notice something you then see more of it you know and um so here's the thing uh, i can't remember the research now it's about 2000 i normally know this one off the top of my head but it's gone it's slipped and there's called the the white the white bear research Have you come across that one and uh this one's really interesting if i say to you now don't think of a white bear Don't think of a pink elephant. And what happens is, is that your brain has to that has thinks of it and they go, oh, you know, but it's that no, because the, the don't bit doesn't register. And so that's the thing. The power brain is very kind of uh, singular like that. So once you sort of like that, I mustn't think about turbulence or like, you know, whatever you think the thing is, you then have to think about it, then go, oh, but I mustn't think, uh, don't think about being scared on a flight. Uh, I don't want to be scared. Your brain has to think of being scared and then negate it, but it doesn't by which time you're already. So we have to be really, really careful of that. And that was just the thing that I thought was going on here. So you've noticed this instance. So back to your question after my long rambling waffle. Um, so, so Alan Pereg answered this on episode 100 and also in his podcast interview. But one of the things that I, he said that I quite liked, he said that, when you think about the military, of course, the safety is. As I used to, a friend of mine was an avian, avionics engineer, and you know, he used to tell me all the checks that they used to do on the RAF aircraft. You know, and so it, it is, it is exceptionally thorough. However, however, you think about the way the military operate, 
that you're rewarded for taking risks. You're not meant to take risks because you're meant to fly as safe as you can, but there is an element of bravery about it. So are, is there more likelihood to be something military? Well, probably there is, you know, because it's you're doing missions, which is different to commercial aviation because you're not on a mission. You're just taking a safe flight. So boring is good when it comes to commercial aviation. They're paid just in case. Whereas of a military, you have goals, you have missions, you have a different set of criteria by which you operate. And the aircraft are designed to be inherently unstable. So commercial aircraft, like big fat sausages that just fly through the air, if the engines fail, they'd still keep flying and all the rest of it. And the same is true for a lot of military aircraft, but some of the sort of the jets and stuff are made so that they are actually slightly weird so that they can flick and change angle and all the rest of it really quickly so they're so they're deliberately made in a way which is less stable than your commercial aircraft i don't know if that answers your question but that's all i've got short notice i'm afraid uh, so rosalie said flying over mountains where to expect turbulence are there certain places to expect turbulence like uh, over water, when there's temperature changes and stuff like that. And I think one of the things one of the pilots will used to say to me is that you should always expect turbulence. That's it. You should always expect turbulence. It's it's out there. So sometimes you get it with all those expected things. So you might get it on the edge of jet streams, which is like these big columns of uh, wind that move around the planet you might get it when you're flying over mountains you'll get it flying over buildings right? so you might get it on a perfectly clear day you might get it going near some clouds you might not get it going near some clouds so i think the message is expect turbulence the main thing is although it, you know you kind of think well it might help me to know when i'm going to get it and then i can sort of deal with that and that's what a lot of people who are anxious think but the reality is, what difference does it make? You know, you might expect to get it and then not get it. So then you're in a heightened state of awareness um, and it doesn't happen, which is quite common. Uh, the other thing is that your perception of turbulence versus mine as a non-turbulence worrier are very different. So I have said this before, but I've flown with people and they've said, I hate this turbulence. And I'm thinking, what turbulence? because it's just normal air movement. So there's always a slight burble as you go along. That's my burble noise. And so that's, for some people, that is turbulent. But it is just, it's just movement of air. It's just how much. It's always moving. And what right have we as a tiny little pea in the atmosphere to expect it to be completely flat, smooth? You know, that's not realistic. We don't have any right to demand that. And so we just have to sort of go with it. You know, so it doesn't really matter. So as long as you've got your seatbelt on and you can get this thought into your head that whatever happens, I'll be fine. You know, the, the aircraft is far stronger than any turbulence. OK, that's a, that's a fact. So if I got my seatbelt on, I'm strapped to this incredibly strong thing flying along with physics, which are mind boggling in terms of the forces that are holding us up there. Bit of turbulence, so what? So you don't have to like it. You don't have to like it. In fact, I don't like it that much. I did had had some turbulence, did some flights. What was it last week? I was up to Edinburgh and back, and uh, it was turbulent on the way back. And it was late. I was really tired, and I just thought, God, this is the last thing I need, you know, because I I just couldn't be bothered for it, you know. But this is all kind of part of flying, you know. A nice two-hour delay, then turbulence, night flight. Oh, what's not to love? Uh, but, you know, it's all part of the gig, you know. Um, so this is kind of linked, actually, to Aphrodite is another question here. So she was uh, so flying and uh, it was from, I think, from Germany. And it was quite, she said it was quite low altitude and didn't. Uh, so it felt it was very, very windy. And I think this is, again, you know, we've just got to expect it to be like that. This is all exactly the same. No matter when you fly, 
you're going to get some sort of form of movement. And, and I see people rejoice, say, oh, it's been a lovely, a lovely, smooth flight. Yeah. You know, I wouldn't want to be, I wouldn't want to be on a flight that's rough as old boots for the whole of duration of it, because that would get wearing very quickly. But um, you don't have to like it. You just need to know that it's not a big deal. It's, it's not going to do anything. There's such strict limits around the way that you can land and take off and all this sort of stuff. And and this is just, this is not a sort of like, oh, one pilot can think, oh, I'll give it a go. It's, it's just set. So this aircraft type flying in to this airport, there'll be a set limit. And one knot higher than that, they can't. So it's really, really strict like that. So if you if you're coming into land, you're going to take off. It's already within the limits, and and many times in my flying career, we will be ready to take off, and then they say no, got to wait. Well, there's a, there's a you know like there's certain wind or there's a cloud passing, the storm cloud nearby. We're not taking off, but, you know. So it's safety, safety first always. So I'm not going to say that in quite a glib way. But, you know, as you know, for those that have watched this before, I try to keep it nice, sort of normal speak, because I think that's where most of us are. You know, I know some people that have a fear of flying have become so well researched in it, Jamie Fraser, that they could probably build an aircraft. But, you know, most of us normal, mere mortals, I like to talk to you. I'm talking to you. So, sorry it wasn't exotic, Gita. Um, Pedro, looking forward to your comments. Pedro always watches Peter Higgins, by the way, but he's in Spain, so hence Pedro. Uh, he always watches and sends some comments, and I live for them to know how it's landed with people, because it's very difficult when you're just like burbling away like I am now to know, is it actually useful? Can people get what they want, or is it annoying and patronising? I'm just going to have a quick look. Um, Ah, yes, you're quite right. And um, I just couldn't see any questions there. So I will come back to that. And I'm just going to um, clear off now and uh, say thank you ever so much for watching. And I will let you know about future podcasts. I've also got another one in the can, which is Melissa. So we're going to be doing that one again. And I've just got to... Um, get myself sorted out so I can actually get these in the right order because sometimes I, I do one and then I do it that week and then I have others that are sitting around in the can for a couple of weeks my brain what I try to do is trying to get some a mixture of sort of technical and sort of interest ones and then I like the fear of flying stories because sort of people seem to like a bit of both and I love the fear of flying stories because I think I find them particularly motivating and also from a purely selfish point of view I love the being able to understand where people's fear has come from. So I've learned much more from doing these podcasts than I probably did from 22 years of running the, the flying right fear courses, even though we had thousands of people come through every year. Because you just get a chance to talk and understand where someone's fear has come from and the process that they've gone through to actually beat it. So, folks, thank you and uh, have a good rest of week. And I will see you or, or speak to you one way or another on the podcast on Wednesday. And I'll keep you posted on all the uh, interesting things that are coming up that we're hoping to get um, get signed off soon, 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 soon. So take care. Have a good evening, afternoon, morning, whatever time zone you're in. <laughs>